He has risen. He has risen. Oh, today is Resurrection Day. The resurrection of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ, from the dead. The Lord Savior, Jesus Christ, has abolished death and brought life and immortality to light through the gospel. This is the day that changed human history forever. World history was never to be the same. Today... 
the heavens declare that death has no power over those who are saved in Jesus' name. This day, 2,000 years ago, by God's determined purpose and foreknowledge, raised Jesus up, having loosed the pains of death because it was not possible that Christ should be held by it. This is the day when the bonds of sin were shattered to bits, allowing the human soul to breathe hope, living hope, and the terrorizing sting and pang of death was defeated and shattered. Remove the resurrection from the Christian faith and you will remove the living hope and replace it with fear, death, agony, despair, discouragement, gloom, and doom. To deny the resurrection is to remove the keystone of Christianity. And without it, the crucifixion of our Lord would mean absolutely nothing. It was the resurrection that validated and gave value to the atoning death of the Lord Jesus Christ. This is the day. Christ is risen. Christ has died. The world to save. Christ is risen from the grave. Christ is risen from the grave. The Lord has risen. The Lord has risen. The Lord has risen. buried beneath my shame who could carry that kind of weight it was my doom till I met you I was buried but not alive all my failures I tried to hide. It was my doom till I met you. You called my name and I ran out of that grave. Out of the
greatest day in history. Death the speed and you have rescued me. Sing it out, Jesus is alive. Empty cross, the empty grave. Life eternal, you have won the day. Shout it out, Jesus is alive. stand in this place free at last meeting face to face I am yours Jesus you are mine endless joy and perfect peace earthly pain finally will see celebrate Jesus is alive
Is your burden weighing heavy? Is it all too much to carry? Well, let me tell you about my Jesus. Do you feel that empty feeling? Because shame's done all it's stealing. And you're desperate for some healing. Well, let me tell you about my Jesus. Amen. Thank you. Thank you, Joe. Amen, brothers. Amen, brother. Good morning. There are people coming in. They ask you if their seats in empty. Can you go towards the middle if it's okay? There are people coming in, and as they come in, don't tell them they're late. Don't mad dog them. It is Easter Sunday service. Amen. Thank you for being here. You know, last year we were outside. We were complaining that it was too hot. Now it's too cold. But 
the sun is out. No more rain. No more rain. No more rain. How appropriate. You know, in the first service, second service, we're always rushing, rushing, rushing. And I wish the worship band can sing another song, but I'm going to take, I'm going to exploit the bad. I'm going to ask Luis and the ladies, they can sing one more song to prepare us. I don't know where you're at right now. I don't know your station in life. I do know that there's something happening today because we know that this day is special. You don't have to be a Christian to understand that today is very special. That's why some of you come today, because you know there's something special. Like many Americans, a poll was out that around 80% of Americans believe in the resurrection. It doesn't matter. If the resurrection does nothing for you, what does it matter? It's when the resurrection does something for you and with you. Today, for me and for many of us, the resurrection is the hope of glory. I know that I'm going to die. All of you are going to die and as we get older, if you have no hope in the resurrection, you're going to be a miserable individual. As you get older, you, you, you look over the horizon and you don't, have, you don't have that much light. And that's why many people get very upset when they get old, they mean and angry and bummed out. Hey, get off my lawn. Because they have no hope. But this day, today is the hope, the hope that we have. Jesus said of his people, he called them sheep. I give my sheep eternal life, and they shall never perish, and no one shall snatch them out of my hand. I give to them eternal life. Father, thank you for this morning. And Father, as we, as we turn off the air conditioners here now, <laughs> we pray, Father, that a, a warm breeze will come as we fellowship together. Father, we may not even know the words of the song, but Lord, permit us to fake it and just worship you. We pray for each individual that's here. You know their private world. You know what's taking place in their own lives. And Father, if they have not found you to warm their heart, to give them understanding, and to open their eyes, may you do that today as we worship you. We love you. We thank you in Jesus' name. Let's worship. You may see, you may have a seat if you cannot handle it, okay? Was filled with his praises One day when sin was as black as could be Jesus came forth to be born of a virgin Dwelled among men, my example is he. Word became flesh and life shined among us. His glory revealed, living he loved me, dying he saved me, buried he carried my sin far away. Rising, he justified freely forever. One day he's coming, oh glorious day, oh glorious day. One day they led him on Calvary's mountain. One day they nailed him to die on a tree. Suffering anguish, despised and rejected. Bearing our sins, my Redeemer is he. Hands that healed nations, stretched out on a tree. Took the nails for me. Living, he loved me. Dying, he saved me. Buried, he carried my sin far away. In rising, he justified freely forever. One day he's coming. Oh, glorious day. Oh, glorious day.
Death could not hold him. The grave could not keep him from rising again. again. Living, he loved me. Dying, he saved me. Buried, he carried my sin far away. And rising, he justified. skies with his glories will shine wonderful day my beloved one bring in my savior jesus is mine living he loved me dying he saved me Rising, he justified freely forever. One day he's coming. Oh, glorious day! Oh, glorious day! Oh, glorious day! Oh, glorious day! Amen. Amen. The Archie fan, thank you so much. Woo, love you guys. Turn around and say hi to somebody, would you? Oh, wonderful. Wonderful. Thank you so much. I want to welcome you to our resurrection service. We begin three services next week. So to the Gospel of Luke 24. The narrative of the resurrection of Jesus is a verified attestment of history. It is mentioned not only in Luke 24, but it's also mentioned in Matthew 28, in Mark 16, in John chapter 20 and 21. All four Gospels gave, bear this testimony of the, of the resurrection of Jesus. Now, let, let me ask you a question. Well, no, let me explain something to you. I was 10 years old. I was selling the LA uh, um, Herald Examiner, a rival to the LA Times. But I had my corner right here in LA, in, in downtown LA in Washington. And I only make like around a, a dollar 20, 80 cents. But those good money in 1963. And then November 22nd, it was on a Friday, the president of the United States was assassinated. And that afternoon, I was selling my papers, and I sold all my papers. And I went to a, a news rack, and I stole all those from there. I paid them, but I sold them because there was a tragedy that happened. So everyone was riveted to the black and white TVs to see the, not only the funeral, but everything that was going on in Dallas, Texas. And allegedly, the shooter was Lee Harvey Oswald. 
And so he was going to be transferred from one place to another. And they had live cameras. And lo and behold, some dude by the name of Jack Ruby takes out a small caliber handgun on live TV, shoots Lee Harvey Oswald. Does anybody remember watching it live? Raise your hands. Okay. Now, please raise them up. I want to prove a point. Okay. What if I called you that you're a liar, that you didn't see that? What would you do? Now, let me bring it up to date. 9-11. How many actually were watching the tragedy? One tower was hit. And then on live TV, you saw the second building get hit. How many remember that? Liars. You're a liar, all of you. How would you feel if you know something that you saw and you witnessed? Well, you see, the resurrection was attested by over 500 people in the New Testament. Not only were they witnesses, but many of them were willing to die for what they believe and what they saw. This is why the, the, the resurrection is not some fable, it's not some, some, some science fiction story. It's for real. And if you believe me, there's a, there's a poll that was taken around four days ago that Americans believe in the resurrection. All those polls are only interested only during the time of the season. I don't really care whether people believe or not. I really don't. I believe in Jesus. I believe in the resurrection. I believe in tradition and culture and religion. I believe all that, but I was living a miserable life. So what that I believe in the resurrection? So what that I believe in Jesus? We used to call him Chewy. What about? So what? But it wasn't until the resurrection became a reality in my life. You'll see this thing happen in here in Luke chapter 24. There are 10 things I want you to see. There, it's not boring, man. I want you to see 10 things that are very clear, very important, very graphic for us to understand what took place. I've entitled this, this study called Athanasia. You may say, I've never heard of Athanasia. Oh, yeah. Let me, let me give you another word. I can't even say it. Athanasia. How do you say when people choose to end their life? You euthanize your dog. So we're familiar with that. What does euthanize mean? To shorten life. To cut the cycle of full potential life. There are men and women who choose today to euthanize themselves because they see a potential life that's going to be cheating them. And they go to Geneva and they go and they execute themselves legally, medically. That's euthanizing. So euthanasia is the opposite. Athanasia means eternal, everlasting, immortal, undying. It's mentioned three times in the gospel. 1 Corinthians 15 and also 1 Timothy chapter 6, verse 16. It is a word that means undying. Immortality is a state of endless life beyond the grave of death, which is obtained following the Lord Jesus Christ. And the resurrection proves that he meant what he said, and he said what he meant. Anybody says, you know what, I will, you kill me, I will rise again the third day. Okay. <laughs> okay. He died. And guess what? He rose again from the dead. Rose again from the dead. Now, in a moment, I'm going to ask you, I'll read all the 52 verses I timed it. It takes me four minutes and 40 seconds. Four minutes and 40 seconds. Now, I share this with you. The many people have never read an entire narration of the resurrection of Jesus Christ. I'm a firm believer that the Bible says, I'm a firm believer what the Bible says. It says that the word of God is living and active and sharper than two-edged sword. Able to penetrate your muscle, your skin, is able to penetrate bone, and the word of God goes directly where? To your heart. Your heart. It's not my job to convince you. My job is to project and proclaim the gospel and to use God's word, not my philosophy, not panchoism, not what I think I know. I want to read the entire chapter. But in so doing, I want you to understand. 
that the resurrection of Jesus is one of the best attested events of history. The Bible says there are over 500 first-hand eyewitnesses. What is an eyewitness? A person who sees an event takes place. You have evidence, you have testimony, you have a declaration, you have proof, you have attestation, you have certification, and you vouch. Now, I, I have my Herald Examiner, my little, my little apron with, for money pocket. I have that. I have an original paper that we sold, and I framed it. I got proof, and I have a picture of me with newspapers on my head. There you see the picture. There you have the evidence. I can give you a testation that I saw what I saw on live television. I'm an eyewitness. You may tell me, you're a liar. I don't believe that. Well, it doesn't matter to me. I know what truth is. Over 500 people witness. There are at least 12 different appearances of Christ in the resurrection accounts. Beginning with Mary and ending with Paul the Apostle. These apparitions were physical, tangible experiences with Christ eating, speaking, and allowing himself to be touched. Now, Paul, forgive me, John, there are 12 apostles. One of them took his own life, Judas. Now we have 11. Out of all the 11 that survive, all of them, for the exception of John, all of them were killed in a horrible, despicable way. All of them were martyred. What's martyred? They gave their life and they would never, re they would never retract what they saw. And they were willing to die. And for 2,000 years, Christians have died for the name of Jesus Christ. There's something about that name. But John was the only survivor. He was probably 84, 85 when the Lord gave him a vision. He's the one that wrote the book of Revelation. But he's the author of the Gospel of John. 1 John and 2 John and 3 John. By the time he was 80 years old, like 30 years after Jesus had ascended into heaven, in 30 years the church was infiltrated with weird doctrine already weird method that crept into the church. There's a lot of things that have crept in into the church that are not biblical. You stick to the word of God and the word of God only. So there's a lot of things that came into the Bible. As I was growing up, I was born into my religion, my culture, scholastically, my, my identity was the religion of my family and my grandparents. And I absorbed that religion. And in that religion, I believe in many things. Like prayer beads, I believe in all that. I believe in purgatory. I believe that if you're a good person, you're going to meet Jesus. He's going to let you in. Because you know why? I did my first communion. Now I did my confirmation. I don't know what you're laughing, but it was very serious for me. And I did what I was supposed to do, but nothing changed. And I was totally ignorant of God's word. Totally ignorant. And then one day, in my hoodlum time, I was 24 years old, I encountered Jesus. And you see here something profound. So we have an eyewitness account here. So John... To set the record straight, because there was a doctrine that came in, they were saying things like, Jesus did not, he, he couldn't raise from the dead. The reality, once you die, you die. And then no one has beaten death yet. So they were trying to squelch the doctrine of resurrection. Paul the Apostle, look at chapter 15 of 1 Corinthians. It's a whole declaration on the resurrection. He concludes by saying this. This is Paul. He says, if there is no resurrection, let's go party. Because we only have one life to live. You ever heard that expression? We only have one life to live. <laughs> yeah, you, better, you better do it now because you know you only, you only go once. 
That's a lie from the enemy. That is not true. Believe a septuagenarian, that's not true. You're going to get all oh, one of these days, you're going to come to a place in your life and you're going to realize, oh man, where did the time gone? And if there's no hereafter, if there's no eternity, well, you're wasting your time. We're wasting our time here. You are wasting your time coming to church if you don't believe there's a resurrection. And if there is no resurrection, forget about it. I will have all the ushers bring all that tequila. Let's get this party. Let's smoke weed. Let's party. But that's not so. For all the apostles said there is a resurrection. And because there is a resurrection, he says, this corruption must put on incorruption. This mortal must put on euthanasia. We must go through death. But we are sure because of Jesus' resurrection, we, the followers, also will follow in that resurrection for us. Absent from the body is to be present with the Lord. So here's John. This, you'll understand now even much better. So he writes for John. And this is what he says. It's like an eyewitness. I attest. You know, I declare. Watch his words, what he says. He, this, is, this is for John chapter 1, verse 1. He says, that which was from the beginning which we have heard, which we have seen with our eyes, which we have gazed upon, and our hands have handled concerning the word of life. That life was manifested, and we have seen, we bear witness, and we declare to you that eternal life which was with the Father and was manifested to us, that which we have seen and heard, we declare to you that you also may have fellowship with us, and truly our fellowship is with the Father and with His Son, Jesus Christ. And these things we write to you that your joy may be full. This is the message which we have heard from him and declared to you that God is light and him there's no darkness at all. If we say that we have fellowship with him and walk in darkness, we lie and we do not practice the truth. He says, we saw him, I saw him, I beheld him, I held him, I touched him, I felt him, I experienced with him, and I'm telling you, so that you also may have fellowship and may you have fullness of joy. The apparition of Jesus Christ, three women meet him at the tomb. Peter and John see the empty tomb and then the women see Jesus. Peter sees Jesus same day. Two disciples are met by Jesus. The apostles they met, but Thomas was not there. Then they meet again and then Thomas is there. Seven apostles met him in the Lake Galilee. 500 people at once saw him in Galilee. James, the half-brother of Jesus in Jerusalem, 1 Corinthians 15, 7, multiple people at the ascension, and then Paul near Damascus, and Stephen when he was stoned to death, and then Paul in the temple once again, and finally John the Beloved. So I'm going to provide 10 things that I want you to see here, 10 things if I may. I'll read first. It, like I said, bear with me. It takes only four minutes and 45 seconds. But you can go along with me if you can. It's much easier. That time goes faster instead of you staring at me. But I want you to notice in the reading, if, the, if you catch 10 things, okay? You're going to catch 10 things. First, we are told by Luke. That in the day of resurrection, we have the first evangelist mentioned in the Bible. What's an evangelist? An evangelist means good news. It means that someone brings the good news. And what is the good news? Jesus is not dead, but he is alive. You're going to see who the first evangelists are. Secondly, you're going to see that Jesus was not a victim of circumstances. Everything he went through was by design. It was according to the purpose of God. You'll see it here three times. Let's see if you catch it. And then the Bible will tell us that the eyes of two disciples were open. Maybe they had their eyes closed all the time. No. It's a metaphor. See if you catch it. 
The fourth thing, the Bible says that the hearts were burning within. It was not heartburn. Something happened inside of us. We have an expression at times. We say things like, you make my heart warm. You ever heard that? When you hear kind words from someone you admire and they tell you, they compliment you, they tell you they love you or they appreciate your meal or someone gives you a compliment for being nice. There's something warm in here happens. It's an affirmation. It's a psychological emotion. But, but it's an expression. Your, your heart does not burn, but it's an expression. And then fifthly, the scriptures will be open. Six. The risen Christ was not a ghost. Seven, the understanding and comprehension of the scriptures. Eight, the promise of the Father. Ninth, Jesus said, you're going to be endued with power. Question is, what kind of power? Muscular power, cerebral power, academic power, financial power. What, what kind of power? And, and this is the power that we're speaking about today, the power of you will see it in a moment. And lastly, the ascension of Christ. What is the ascension? Ascension means going up. Descension is going down. The ascension of Jesus Christ. See, it's not an assumption. The assumption of Mary. According to their own theology of Mariology, they believe that Mary had no sin. Therefore, if she had no sin, she couldn't die. And so where is she? So there's the assumption. We assume that she ascended to heaven, but nowhere is recorded that she ascended to heaven. Only Jesus is recorded here in Luke 24 and Acts chapter 1. But see if you can pick it up yourself. Bear with me, time with me, or go along with me. I'll be so content when I finish because no matter what I say to, during this service, I am fully content and knowing very well that the word of God will have a greater impact than my speech and what I'm saying. The word of God has a way of speaking to you and convincing you without any hesitation. Because it's not speaking to your mind. It's not speaking to your intellect. The word of God speaks to your heart. Maybe you won't get it now. But maybe in a day. Maybe in two days. Maybe three days. Maybe in a year from now. You'll see it. I've been reminded of people when they say, you say things, man, that, that stuck in my head, man. And so, verse 1. Now, in the first day of the week, very early in the morning, they. Now, who are they? You'll find them in chapter 23. And certain other women with them came to the tomb bringing the spices which they had prepared. But they found the stone rolled away from the tomb. Then they went in and did not find the body of the Lord Jesus Christ. And it happened as they were greatly perplexed about this, that behold, two men stood by them in shining garments... Then as they were afraid and bowed their faces to the earth, they said to them, Why do you seek the living among the dead? He is not here, but he is risen. Remember how he spoke to you when he was in Galilee, saying, The Son of Man must be delivered into the hands of sinful men and be crucified and the third day rise again. And they remember his words. Then they returned from the tomb and told all these things to the eleven apostles and to all the rest. It was Mary Magdalene, it was Joanna, it was Mary the mother of James and other women with them who told these things to the apostles and their words seemed to them like idle tales and they did not believe them. But Peter arose and ran to the tomb and stooping down, he saw the linen cloths lying by themselves and he departed marveling to himself at what had happened. Now behold, Two of them, disciples, were traveling that same day to a village called Emmaus, which was seven miles from Jerusalem. And they talked together of all these things which had happened. So it was while they conversed and reasoned that Jesus himself drew near and went with them. Verse 16, but their eyes were restrained, so they did not recognize or know Jesus. And Jesus said to them, what, what kind of conversation is this that you have with one another as you walk and you're so sad? Then one of them, whose name was Cleopas, answered and said to him, Are you the only stranger in Jerusalem? You have not known the things which happened here in these days? And he said, What things? So they said to him, 
the things concerning Jesus of Nazareth, who was a prophet mighty in deed and word before God and all the people, and how the chief priests and our rulers delivered him to be condemned to death and crucified him. Verse 21. But we were hoping that it was he who was going to redeem Israel. Indeed, besides all this, today is the third day since this thing happened. Yes, and certain women of our company who arrived at the tomb early, they astonished us. When they did not find his body, they came out saying that they had also seen a vision of angels who said he was alive. And certain of those who were with us went to the tomb and they found it just as the women had said. But him they did not see. Then Jesus said to these two guys, Oh, you foolish ones and slow of heart to believe in all that the prophets have spoken. Verse 26, ought not the Christ, the Messiah, to have suffered these things and enter into his glory? And beginning at Moses, the law, the first five books, and all the prophets, he expounded to them in all the scriptures the things concerning himself. Then they drew near to the village where they were going, and Jesus indicated that he would have gone further. But they constrained him, saying, Abide with us, for it is towards even, and the day is far spent. So he went to stay with them. Now it came to pass, as he sat at the table with them, that he took bread, blessed it, and broke it, and gave it to them. Then their eyes were open, and they knew him, and he vanished from their sight. And they said to one another, trip out? No, no, no. <laughs> Look what he says. Did not our heart burn within us while he talked to us on the road and while he opened the scripture to us? So they rose up that very hour and returned to Jerusalem and found the 11 apostles and those who were with them gathered together saying, the Lord is risen indeed and he has appeared to Simon. And they told about the things that had happened on the road and how Jesus was known to them in the breaking of bread. 36. Now as they said these things, Jesus himself whoosh, stood in the midst of them and said to them, Shalom, peace to you. But they were freaking out to the bone. They were terrified, petrified, and frightened because they supposed they had seen a what? A spirit, and he said to them, why are you troubled? And why do you doubts arise in your hearts? Behold my hands and my feet, that it is I myself. Handle me, touch me, and see. For a spirit does not have flesh and bones, as you see I have. When he had said this, he showed them his hands and his feet. But, while they still did not believe for joy and marvel, he said to them, have you any food here? So they gave him a piece of broiled fish and some honeycomb, and he took it and ate in their presence. Verse 44, then he said to them, these are the words which I spoke to you while I was still with you, that all things must be fulfilled which were written in the law of Moses, written in the prophets, and written in the Psalms concerning me. And he opened their understanding that they may comprehend the scriptures. Then he said to them, thus it was written, and thus it was necessary for the Messiah, the Christ, to suffer and to rise from the dead the third day, and that repentance and remission of sins should be preached in his name to all nations, beginning at Jerusalem. Verse 48, and you are what? Say it loud. You are witnesses of these things. Behold, I send the promise of my Father upon you, but tarry, that means wait in the city of Jerusalem until you are endued with power from on high. And as he led them out as far as Bethany, he lifted up his hands and blessed them. Now it came to pass while he blessed them that he was parted from them and carried up into heaven. And they worshipped him and returned to Jerusalem with great joy and were continually in the temple praising God and blessing God. Amen. How many of you, this is the first time you read the entire narrative of the resurrection? Raise your hands. See, I'm happy. I'm happy. Because now you can walk away and say, do you know the narrative of the resurrection? You can say, according to Luke, yep. 
You can say that now. Many people do not. Many people only come to church and they hear it, blah, 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 and they have no, absolutely no clue of what's going on. So here, I want to share with you the first evangelists. Who were the first evangelists? I'll give you a hint. Men or women? See, even saying it would get weird. Women. <laughs> they were the women. Mary Magdalene. Mary Magdalene, according to Matthew chapter 20, she had a whole, uh, she had a whole dialogue with Jesus. She went back to the tomb on her own. And the Bible says that the tomb was empty and she was crying and weeping. And then she hears a voice, Mary. And she turns around and she thought he was the what? The gardener. Because it, it was a garden. And so she said, bring back the body, whatever you laid in, please lead him to me. And Jesus said, Mary, Mary, Mary. It's me, Jesus. I can feel it. She's a woman. What does that mean? I live with five women. I have my wife and have four daughters. I know how women are, man. Mary was a bad reputation, Mary Magdalene. She was possessed. Seven demons in her. And the Lord delivered her out of her. Who were these women? According to Luke chapter 23 and verse 49, it says, the women who followed him from Galilee stood at a distance watching the crucifixion. In verse 55 of Luke 23, and the women who had come with him from Galilee followed after, and they observed the tomb and how his body was laid. Then they returned and prepared spices and fragrant oils, and they rested on the Sabbath according to the commandment. These are all women. The women were the ones. It was Mary and the other Mary, Mary the mother of James and Salome. And so who were the first evangelists? We are told in Matthew 28 that when the women go into the tomb, they find an angelic presence. And he goes, do not be afraid. We know who you're looking for, but he's no longer here. He has risen from the dead. Come, see, go, tell. I said, Matthew chapter 28, verse 5 through 8. Come, see. He's gone. Go tell. First evangelist. If the word evangelist means someone who brings the good news. And then I'm telling you that our society, our culture, all across our nation needs good news right now. I mean, when you hear that the White House proclaimed this Easter Sunday, the atrocity what the White House named this day. I don't get political, but that's damning. That's not uniting the United States. That is dividing the United States. Why couldn't you declare whatever that day is tomorrow? Anytime. We're Americans. I agree. But not on this holy day. And yet the White How many know what I'm talking about? See, I'm just trying to evade all that madness. But I couldn't believe, no, I can believe it. it. What it does, it creates a horrible psychological stake in the heart of the American people. And we're going through so much that people are hearing bad news, bad news. When you go home today, wherever you're at, whatever your, your influence, circle of influence is, give them good news. Give them good news. Evangelists were the first ones. They were women. Secondly, Jesus was not a victim of circumstances. We are told that in verse 5 and 7. We are told that in verse 25, 27. And we are told in verses 44, 47. That all the sorrow, all the pain, all the sacrifice, what Jesus went through, it was all preordained by God. This is what Peter says in his first message in the book of Acts chapter 2, 23. Jesus Christ was delivered by the determined purpose and foreknowledge of God. And by lawless hands, he was crucified and put to death. This is orchestrated by God. For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son that whosoever 
desire shall live and have eternal life and never perish. He gave. Isaiah the prophet had prophesied exactly what he was going to do. In the Living Bible, it says this in Isaiah 53, describing Jesus. He was despised and rejected. A man of sorrows, acquainted with the deepest grief. We turn our backs on him and look the other way. He was despised and we did not care. Yet it was our weaknesses he was, he was carrying. It was our sorrow that weighed him down. And we thought his troubles were a punishment from God, a punishment for his own sins. But he was pierced for our rebellion. He was crushed for our sins. He had done no wrong and had never deceived anyone. But he was buried like a criminal. He was put in a rich man's grave. But it was the Lord's good plan to crush him and to cause him grief. And he made his life an offering for our sin. Begin the orchestration of God. Jesus was not a victim of circumstances. Oh, well, the Romans had me. Oh, the religious people. There's nothing I can do. You remember when they came to the garden to arrest Jesus? Isaiah says that he has no desirable face that he looks handsome. He looks average. So average that when Judas betrayed him, Judas had to tell the arresting posse, who is Jesus? They go, well, listen, oh, I know it's a lot of the, the, way, the way you're going to tell that's Jesus is when I give him a kiss. That's how they will recognize Jesus. So they go and arrest Jesus, right? And they arrest him. They come with swords and clubs. And Peter takes his sword. He's a fisherman. He's not a swordman. So he aimed for the head but took the guy's ear off. And Jesus put it right back together. And then Jesus said, put your sword away. Hear this. Don't you know that I can call ten legions of angels right now? Then why don't you call them? Because this is the night. This is the night of the power of darkness. Let us fulfill scripture. Wow. Third thing. Not only was Jesus not a victim of circumstances, but... We'll find, <laughs> I got the wrong page. The eyes were open. What does that mean, the eyes were open? You see in verse 16, it says, the two disciples, but their eyes were restrained. So that they did not know him. The word know him is the Greek word epigenosko. Sounds like konosko, mosko, konosko. Epigenosko. Their eyes were restrained. Now, if you have a King James Bible, the Bible says that their eyes were holden, H-O-L-D-E-N. How many have New King, uh, King James? Does it have the word holden? Right? Holden. What does holden mean? Is that William Holden? Now, if I say Bill and Holden, you don't. But who, what does holden mean? The word holden means restricted. That means that someone has control over them. They possessed it. So to me, it says that they could not recognize him because Jesus wanted to hear what they're saying. Because if they would have recognized Jesus immediately, they, they, they wouldn't have confessed their, their doubt, their hurts. They were bumped out. Why are you walking, talking to each other, and you're very sad? Because they were dejected. They thought that Jesus would be the Messiah, but they left. And they said, we hear all this gossip. He's, he's risen from the dead. And now all these women, you know how women are. And they're telling them, yeah, we saw him, but they couldn't find him. The, empty, the tomb was empty. Man, they couldn't find him. Jesus said, oh, you foolish of heart. He says, don't you know? Don't you realize that the Messiah had to suffer? And according to scriptures, and the Bible said he expounded the scriptures to them. But their eyes were closed. And all of a sudden their eyes are open. It says here in verse, in verse uh, 30. Now it came to pass as he sat at the table with them. That's fellowship. And he took bread, blessed and broke it, and gave it to them. Then their eyes were open. And they knew him. But as soon as they knew him, gone. How would you, the theater of my imagination is trippy. 
I mean, how would you be if, you know, you can't recognize Jesus, and then he's praying, bless our bread, Father, and I know who you are. He's gone. I would have said, dude, did you see that? Trip out. But they said that their eyes were open. What does that mean? It's not literally that they have their eyes closed. This is when God opens your eyes. You see, the Bible says that without Jesus, we walk in darkness. And the light of God is not with us. And our understanding is darkened. We don't understand how God operates. And we live like domesticated, high-value animals. God, oh, I believe in God, but there's no activity that you do believe in God. So when God opens your eyes, in Matthew 7, 7, he says, when you knock, it will be open. Your eyes will be open. Paul the apostle, uh, he was a thug, right? And he became a Christian, and he relates his, his conversion or transformation in Acts chapter 9. He talks about it in Acts chapter 22, but it isn't until we get to Acts 26 that Paul gives the mission that God gave him. He says, Paul, I will deliver you from the Jewish people as well as from the Gentiles to whom now I send you to, number one, to open their eyes, number two, in order to turn them from darkness to light, Number three, and turn him from the power of Satan to God. Number four, that they may receive forgiveness of sins. And number four, that they may inherit the inheritance among those who are sanctified by me. David, in Psalm 119, 18, he said, Lord, open my eyes that I may see wondrous things from your law. Paul Baloch is a worship singer, very well-known man. He's known in the worship circles. I think in 2002, right after 9-11, he wrote a song that we sing a lot. And I believe that he hit the right the content and how, what he's speaking about here. I'll try to sing it, and I'm not a singer, but if you're a singer, you follow me. The song goes like this. Open the eyes of my heart, Lord. Open the eyes of my heart. I want to see you. I want to see you. To see you high and lifted up. Shining in the light of your glory. Pour out your power and love. As we sing holy, holy, holy. One more time. Holy, holy, holy. I want to see you. Open the eyes of my heart. Not your intellect. Open your heart. In Hebrew phraseology, the heart is the seat of emotion. The seat of will. You ever heard this expression, you can take a horse, you can force him to take him to the water well, but you cannot, you cannot force him. Same thing with all of you. I don't have the power to force you. Not even God has the What kind of God will force you? That's Mohammedism. They force you to receive at the sword. If you don't receive, they kill you. Jesus doesn't know you're killing yourself. Why would I want to kill you? I came to give you life and love abundantly. I didn't come to condemn you. I came to give you life. Not obligation. He knocks at the door of our hearts. If we open our heart, he will come in. No one can force you. In the first service, second service, people have their hearts open. I'm going to do what I did in first service, second service. I will give you that opportunity like I had the opportunity. Would you like to open your heart to receive the good news? No one can make you. You're going to have your own mind. I don't need it. I'm okay. But you're not okay. Look at your station in life. Look at, the, look at the torture, look at the, 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 the emptiness. Pancho, you don't know me. I know. But I'm telling you this, if you don't know Jesus, you don't know peace. If you don't know Jesus, you don't understand divine hope. You don't have divine joy, divine hope, divine assurance. You don't have none of that. 
I'm not a perfect person. I'm flawed. I'm perforated. But I know who I trusted. And he who began a good thing will be faithful to fulfill it in me. Don't look at me and say, well, you know, he's weird. Okay, that's right. But if you're going to go to hell because you think that I'm a little weird, and then you are much weirder than I am. Because I'm pointing you to Jesus. I'm pointing you to Jesus. I'm like a traffic controller. Me? No, over there, over there, over there, over there, over there. No, you're going the wrong way, way. That's, that's the wrong way. No. This way, way. This way. This is the way. And then in verse 32, then our hearts burn within us. See, biblical passages show that the heart stands for the principle C again. And then number one, number five, verse 32. It says here in verse 32, and they said to one another, did not our heart burn within us? While he talked with us on the road and while he opened the scripture to us. How do you open the scripture to somebody? What, is, what does that mean? You see, he goes back to verse 27. Look what it says in verse 27. And beginning at Moses and all the prophets, he what? Expounded. That's the word. What is the word to expound? To explain or comment on or to reveal the meaning. You see, Paul the apostle, he was a teacher. He was a Pharisee. He found grace through Jesus Christ. When he would go to the Jewish temples, he knew what kind of people he was dealing with. You see, traditional religious people are the hardest to come to Jesus Christ. Because they're smug in their own religion. They're smug in their own contentment. I already did my first communion. I had my confirmation. And I, I did this. I did that. And, 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 and it's very hard for them to come to Jesus. That's why people who are all jacked up, messed up, tore up. They're the easiest to come to Jesus. Because they realize I have nothing. I have nothing to offer him. I'm broken. I'm jacked up. And it says, if you can change my life, then change it. Where others think they're smug. Oh, I got it together. I don't need it. I don't need it. It's fine. Paul the Apostle knew what he was dealing with. So we are told, we got a little glimpse of how he taught. There in Acts chapter 17 and verse 2 and 3, the Bible says that Paul the Apostle, as his custom was, he will go to a Jewish temple. And as Paul was speaking in the Jewish synagogues, he reasoned with them from the scriptures. He explained the scriptures. He demonstrated through the scriptures that Jesus Christ had to suffer and rise again from the dead. And saying, this Jesus whom I preach to you is the Messiah. Explaining, demonstrating, and expounding. Explaining means opening. It means to appeal, to restore on the basis of the facts found in scripture. And proving suggests that he succeeds in identifying Jesus as the Messiah of the Old Testament. That's explaining. He was demonstrating. That means to place alongside. That means to put forth and set forth. Alleging to present or bring forward as a source of authority to bring forward a reason or excuse. And then the word expounding is very important. The word X, think of the word X. What does usually X mean? X, extract, out. So exposition means to extract and place alongside, means to expose, to set forth, to defend with an argument, to explain by setting forth carefully in elaborate detail to explain. Expound means to give a detailed description and explanation of a theory or viewpoint or an explanation of the meaning and implications of a written text. I don't want you to learn these words, but they're not going to be in the test. But there's two methods. It's called exegesis, E-X-E-G-I-G-I-S, exegesis. And there's eisegesis, E-I-S-E-G-I-S, eisegesis. Now, exegesis is very important because exegesis means the process of careful, analytical study of biblical passages like me. Like what I did right now, at the expense of you perhaps being bored, I walk away satisfied that 
Either what I said meant nothing, but you read God's word with me and you heard it. God will do his work with his work. But it's my responsibility to expound the scriptures. You see, what happens, I used to go to a church, and I won't mention the name of the church. But my wife and I, we went to this church, and we just got saved, and we were young. And that's what we, well, anyway. So we'll, the pastor will, will, will take one, script, one scripture, one verse, and he will elaborate around the verse. I said, Jesus, later on, I knew what that was. He will take a text out of context and create a pretext. You understand what I'm saying? You take one verse and you isolate it and you work around it. And I build it up only to convince you, but the scripture is out of context. When a text is out of context, it becomes a pretext. Paul the Apostle says, I will not... I will not fail to give you the full counsel of God. And Paul the apostle and Jesus did the same thing for the disciples. He opened their hearts and the scriptures to them. Number six, the risen Christ was not a ghost, a spirit. What is a spirit? It's the ghost of their dead Lord, but not himself in the body. It was an apparition. It happens today. There are accounts after account after account all over the world. That when the loved ones die, they appear again, but they're not with flesh and bones. They're ephemeral, they're, they're, they're light, they're vaporous. And, and they hear, I, I, is that you, Grandma? This is real, man. They love the loved ones and they hear, and they, but, but it's not them. The Bible says once you go over the precipice of death, you cannot come back again. But he came back. And he went through the doors. What kind of body does he have? As he went through the door, all of a sudden, boom, they were frightened. They thought he was a ghost. But here's the thing. Ghosts and spirits cannot consume food. So he said, I'm not a ghost. Why are you tripping? Touch me. Behold me. And he showed him his feet, showed him his hands. But they still not believed. That's why Jesus said, you know what? I know you guys that you think I'm a ghost. Do you have anything to eat? <laughs> oh, you have a burrito right here. Do you have any salsa with it? And right in front of me, he goes, hey, check this out. They were tripping out. And he opened their understanding. Verse 45. The Lord opened their understanding to understand the scriptures. Number eight, the promise of the Father. What is the promise of the Father? Well, you find it in, in the book of Acts chapter 1 because Luke is the author. When you find it, it's just like opening the page to Acts 1, it follows it up. So he says, I'll give you the promise of my Father. And what is the promise of the Father? The Bible said it was the giving in mass sale, the Holy Spirit. He told us in John chapter 14 and 15 and 16 that when the Holy Spirit comes, he will be called the spirit of what? Of truth. Whom the world cannot receive him because they don't know him, but the Holy Spirit will be in you, with you, and upon you. And when the Holy Spirit comes, he will come for you. He will guide you. He will lead you. He will transform you. It is not religion that changes the Christian. It is the office and the work and the operation of the Holy Spirit. When the Holy Spirit comes upon you, you can say goodbye to Jose Cuervo and Johnny Walker at the same time. You can say with authority, I don't want weed anymore, man. All of a sudden you have judicial reasoning. You open your eyes. You have an understanding of the scriptures and you're born again. You're no longer the same. So when the spirit of Christ, the, of the Holy Spirit comes upon you, and he says in Acts chapter 1 verse 8, and when the spirit of Christ comes upon you, the spirit of God, the Holy Spirit, he says you will have power. What kind of power? It's not gold gem power. It is not cerebral, credential power. It's not academic power. It's not political power. It is not the power of being cute. Cute only lasts like two years, ladies, two years. 
guys, half a year. <laughs> After that, man, just... what he's speaking about is called, in the Bible, it's called dunamis. Dunamis. That means a sophisticated dynamite. That's where we get the word from, dynamite. Dynamic. You can't make that up, man. The Holy Spirit comes, and then you undo it with power. Paul the Apostle and even Jesus said, the same spirit that raised Jesus from the dead dwells in you. Wow. Amazing. The same spirit who raised Jesus from the dead. I like you. That's Romans 8, 11. And lastly, lastly, number 10, the ascension. Not an assumption. It is the act of going to heaven in bodily form from earthly life. You don't have to go there, but let me read it for you in context. Because it's important to understand that Jesus went up to heaven. That's called the ascension. Only two other men in the Bible have done that. Anybody know who they are? Say it. Enoch and Elijah. All the rest have to go by way of the earth. From dust to dust, ashes to ashes. That's the way we're going to go. But Jesus did not do that. He went bodily. What's the purpose? We are told in verse 9 of the, of the book of Acts chapter 1. Now when Jesus has spoken these things while they watch, he was taken up and a cloud received them out of their sight. And while they looked steadfastly towards heaven, as he went up, behold, two men stood by them in white apparel, who also said, Men of Galilee, why do you stand gazing up into heaven? This same Jesus, who was taken up from you into heaven, will so come in like manner as you saw him go into heaven. There we find a promise that Jesus will return again. Why is he in heaven? The Bible says he sits at the right hand of the Father. What is he doing at the right hand of the Father? Interceding for you and I. He says, come boldly to the throne of grace in time of great need. But one of these days, he's going to get up from the throne. And he's not going to come back like a little lamb. He's not going to be beaten by Pilate. He's not going to be beaten by Romans. He's not going to be beaten by anybody. He's going to come in a white horse. And judgment will come with him. And he will be the king of kings and the Lord of lords. Today he's the God of mercy. Hallelujah is right, man. Hallelujah is right. Hallelujah is right. He's coming. People can make fun of me all they want. I lost all my friends, so-called friends, because I became a Christian. So be it. I am what I am by the grace of God. Let's all stand. Let's invite the group. Listen. You're here today. The group is coming. We, we orchestrated this. We did that. To facilitate an opportunity for you. Whoever you are. Whoever you are. Whatever you've done. Whatever heinous act, whatever transgression, whatever sin, whatever stupidity, whatever rebellion, it can be forgiven. Let your eyes be open. Let your heart become warm, burn inside. Let him give you the understanding to open the understanding of our mind. That he will give you the understanding that you need. He is the Alpha and the Omega. He is the Lord that defeated death once and for all. And he wants to give you life and life abundantly. I cannot force you. I share that with you. All I can do is provide the good news. I gave you that information. Now it's up to you. Would you like to receive him? I'm going to ask you in a moment as they begin to worship. To get out of your seat. Come and stand here in front of me. Right here. I'll pray with you to receive the Lord. No obligation, no commitment. We'll give you a free Bible to get on your way. But don't leave without him. Maybe you don't want to come alone. Ask your friend, will you come with me? They'll come with you. 
or perhaps they don't want to come with you, shine them on. You come and make peace. Father, we pray that you touch those that want to be touched by you. Open their hearts, Lord. Open their hearts. Open the eyes of their heart that they may see you, they may feel you. Draw them to you by your power in Jesus' name. Let's worship. You come, whoever you are. One day when heaven was filled with his praises, one day when sin was as black as could be, Jesus came forth to be born of a virgin, dwelled among men, my example is he. Word became flesh and light shined among us, his glory revealed, living he loved me, dying he saved me, buried he carried my sin far away, rising he justified, freely Anybody else, quickly, we'll wait, whoever you are, don't leave, man, don't leave the same way you came in, you know what time it is, don't, don't say, I don't understand, you understand, man, come on up, we'll sing it one more time, come on up, whoever you are, quickly, come and receive, don't leave out, walk away with condemnation and guilt, man, here's the worst part, you already know what's happening, you go back home without Jesus, you're not going to sleep tonight, not even tomorrow, because now you know. Make peace with God. Make peace with God today. We'll sing it one more time. At least change his guitar so we can get down to the ground. Go for it, Luis. You come. We'll wait for you, Papa. Come on up. Come on up, man. Come on up. This worship. Come on up. One day they led him on Calvary's mountain. One day they nailed him to die on a tree suffering anguish despised and rejected bearing our sins my redeemer is he hands that healed nations stretched out on a tree took the nails for me Dying, he saved me. Buried, he carried my sin far away. Rising, he justified freely forever. One day he's coming. Oh, glorious day. Oh, glorious day. Anybody else? Double time, double time. Anybody else? We'll wait for you. Anybody else? We good? Are we good? I don't think so, man. <laughs> I don't think so. I wish you had my view that I have. Some of you, I'm going to look at you. Some of you have a distorted face. You have, you're spook. You're in darkness. And God just exposed you. But he wasn't... He wants to want to condemn you or damn you. He wants to give his light to you. Come out of darkness and obscurity and come to the light. Anybody else? Quickly, real quick light. Anybody else? We're good? We're good. For those of you that are here, would you repeat the simple prayer after me? We have some people to my, my right, your left, and want to give you a Bible. No obligation. But would you simply repeat the simple prayer after me? Dear Jesus forgive me. I'm a sinner. Open my eyes. Open my heart as I receive you as my Lord and Savior. Fill me with your Holy Spirit. Create in me a new mind, a new heart, 
and a clean conscience. Put my name in the book of life. In Jesus' name, amen. Happy resurrection. Come and get your Bible. Come and get your Bible. I don't know where the Bible people are at, but uh, here we go. Here we go. The Lord bless you. The Lord watch over you. He has risen and he has risen indeed. The Lord be with you. God bless you. Love you. Declare my joys to the nations. I will shout for joy in the congregation. I will worship God. Worship God. All my days, those who love the Lord, I satisfy. Those who trust in Him, I justify. I will serve my God. Raise